Hi, my name is Asya Trofimov, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Research in Immunology and Cancer and at the University of Montreal. And uh, today I will be presenting my paper, which is Factorized Embeddings Learns Rich and Biologically Meaningful Embedding Spaces Using Factorized Tensor Decomposition. So my work is on RNA sequencing. And um, gene expression data usually looks kind of like this. So there's a certain number of samples and a certain number of genes and gene expression values. And usually um, people attempt to either get a sample representation for, for example, uh, discovering new cell types or um, you know, analyzing patient data. And usually this is done using some kind of dimensional reduction algorithms. So PCA, TSNE, and recently UMAP. Uh, very rarely people are going to do uh, dimensional eye reduction on genes, so, but there are some. So, for example, DNA2VEC and Gene2VEC, um, and recently uh, Schreiber and colleagues on Choi have published similar models. Um, so, my work is uh, very similar to the ones by uh, Choi, Schreiber, and Du, and it's basically to use tensor factorization to learn two representation spaces simultaneously. So we're trying to learn a sample and a gene representation. So if we look at sort of formally what all of this looks like, the gene expression data, et cetera, um, this is the gene expression matrix. So you have a certain number of samples and each sample is actually uh, has M values, which are in this case genes. So um, each cell within this matrix can be addressed as X, I, J, where I is the sample index and J is the gene index. So the factorized embeddings model is what I'm presenting today. And it's a model that learns two functions, a function called F sample and a function called F gene. So F sample and F gene both map from an integer to a Z sample or Z gene space. And the space is in K dimensions and it's um, real values. So when you give this function a index, so in this case the ith index, so patient i, uh, it gets it, it it spits out a new coordinate in k dimensions for that sample, and the same for g. Then uh, these two coordinates are taken up by a function g. G that transforms the concatenated pair of embeddings into a gene expression measurement. So here I'm calling it X hat, XIJ hat, because it's the um, reconstructed one or like imputed one. Um, and all of this is implemented as an artificial neural network. And we train all of these functions together by gradient descent with our mean squared error cost function, which goes through all Ns and all Ms um, one at a time and attempts to predict uh, the, the, the gene expression. And of course, the penalty is how different the gene expression prediction is from the real one. So what this actually is doing is in the beginning, the sample, so the, this, this embedding space, so this is the sample embedding space, it's actually not really meaningful. So all of the samples are at zero. Um, but as this is trained, it's actually forcing this uh, embedding space to contain enough information to be able to predict the expression for each sample and each gene. So here you can see that as training goes, the model learns to push apart um, sample embeddings and seems to group them by tissue type. And there's also a smaller group for tissue subtypes. Um, the first thing that we looked at to sort of get an idea if our model was working well is uh, the reconstruction. We were measuring it using Pearson correlation. And here um, you're looking, so the, the, the A's, the dark blue, is the reconstructed versus the original. And you can see that the correlations is pretty high. Um, then we were looking also at similar tissue but a different person. And you can see that the correlation is a bit lower. And uh, th this is good because this means that the model isn't just learning like an average for that specific tissue. And this one here, uh, the D, is um, the same person 
however, a different tissue. So also uh, you can see that the performance drops when you look at the, the, the correlation between the two. And also it is of note that this is not just all of the genes, but it's actually the tissue specific genes for each one of these tissues. And this is actually measured using the earth movers distance for um, let's say a, for each gene. And here, for example, we're selecting uh, all of the samples that are of tissue C and all of the samples that are not of tissue C, and we're looking at gene J, and then we're measuring using the earth movers distance, the amount of information that this gene contains in order to distinguish all of the samples of this type from the others. So the higher the number, the more information it contains. And so we chose arbitrarily the 65th percentile. So we're looking at genes. We're trying to reconstruct here only genes above that threshold. So they're like harder to reconstruct. Another thing that we looked at is the preservation of gene, uh, the preservation of uh, distance in original and imputed space. And you can see that for uh, this random sample of 1,500 pairs of patients, um, the distance, the pairwise distances is, are, are conserved. So our conclusion here was that the factorized embeddings model does reconstruct the data with high accuracy and preserves sample pairwise distances. Then we were looking sort of at how the uh, sample embedding space is organized. And so we selected four reporter genes. Um, one of them is MYL2, so this is myosin, it's expressed by muscle tissues, so there's only two tissue types that have it, muscle and heart intercept in our samples, and uh, the tissue specific, so it is tissue specific, and the expression is high. Then we selected keratin, which is expressed by a, a, a bigger amount of tissues in our data set, so keratin is expressed by epithelia, and so yes, it's tissue specific, but like to a larger group, and the expression is also high. Although CD8B is a tissue-specific gene, technically, um, we, the GTEx data comes from a tissue bank, and there's a lot of infiltrating lymphocytes, so there is some residual low expression of CD8B. So we selected CD8B as a non-tissue-specific gene with sort of low background expression. And finally, we selected EXIST, which is not a tissue-specific gene, but it's a sex-specific gene, and so um, the expression is also low. And what you can see is that when we look at the factorized embedding space, so these are every point here is a sample, and the color represents the uh, relative gene expression uh, of each of these four genes. And you can see that uh, factorized embeddings, but not T-SNE, so we compared it to, to a 2D T-SNE, factorized embeddings, but not T-SNE, organizes the samples according to individual relative gene expression. So um, you can see that there's sort of this great color gradient that's happening, and uh, this is not preserved for EXIST. Uh, if you have questions about this, uh, we have sort of analyzed this in more detail, and we can talk about it a bit later if you want. So our conclusion here is that the factorized embedding trained sample embeddings are consistent with individual gene expression levels. Uh, what it actually also allowed us to do is to uh, look at interpolation. So what we did is for every, so we cast a grid over the embedding space. And for every point on that grid, we generated a new prototype patient that doesn't really exist. And for each one of those prototypes, we looked at the predicted gene expression pro profiles. So here, uh, again, the color is uh, according to the relative predicted gene expression. And you can see that the model has very specific regions where, according to the model, the samples that express that gene should be. So here are predicted to express high amounts of MYL2. And we have annotated with white dots the centroids for various tissues, and we annotated relevant centroids. So you can see here that heart and muscle seem to be in that region same for keratin and also for CD8B. You can see that the two cell types that express CD8B at high levels, which is blood and spleen, seem to be in that region. So our conclusion here is that the learned factorized embedding space is dense and allows for interpolation. 
uh, for the 50D embedding space. So we, we were kind of uh, testing 2D and 50D. And then in the end, since 50D was um, performing better at reconstruction, we uh, wanted to um, test sort of this interpolation thing, but then we couldn't really do it because you can't really look at a 50D space by eye. So what we did is we um, performed an auxiliary uh, test using vector arithmetics. So as seen as uh, in uh, Michaelov and, and uh, colleagues in 2013. So basically uh, say we have two groups here and the reds are lungs and the black are kidneys. And so then we look at the two centroids for these two. And then we can measure this like vector u, which is um, a, a vector between the two centroids. So then if we take a sample here and we apply this vector, we would get a new sample, which is this sample as a lung. So this, it was a kidney and now it's a lung using this like vector arithmetic. And then using this embedding, we actually decode an entire transcriptome and then we measure uh, how this transcriptome looks like, like how different it is from the, the, the real one for that person. So um, what we found is that when uh, you're decoding this thing, when you're comparing it to the real one, so a matched tissue sex and person ID, you're actually getting really, really close to the real one. So this was very encouraging. Um, if you're looking at another tissue for that person, you're actually also very close. Um, and if you're looking at um, a different person, but the same tissue, you can see that the values are a bit lower. And so even though the mean here is the same, or rather the median here is the same, uh, the the for for a lot of them, the same person but not the same tissue was closer to the original. So um, our conclusion is that in 50D, the factorized embedding seems to retain sort of individual specific information um, on top of just tissue specific. We were then looking at how genes are organized in gene embedding space. And here again, we're using the uh, tissue specificity with uh, the um, earth movers distance. And you can see here that uh, this is, th the color is tissue specificity. So the closer it is to red, the more tissue specific it is. And so this is gene embedding space. So every point is a gene. And you can see that there's actually little groups of tissue specific genes that are forming and we were wondering what these groups were. So we looked at which uh, tissues do these correspond to and actually the group by tissue. So uh, for example, um, the green ones uh, are male tissues. So I think it was testis and prostate. Uh, and then the blue ones are brain. Um, so our conclusion was that the learned gene representation reflects to a certain point gene tissue specificity. And also we were looking at correlations because the, the, those are the two things that usually are looked at when analyzing gene expression data. And we found that when genes were highly correlated, they are actually very close by in embedding space. So this is the Euclidean distance between pairs of genes and this is the correlation. However, uh, the, the, the reverse is not necessarily true. So although there were some genes that were further apart when they weren't correlated, some, some of them were not correlated, but close by. So there was some sort of decision that the model has made. And um, so our conclusion is that the model has retained some gene-gene correlations, but not all. Um, although we were very happy to see nothing here, which means that there's no genes that are correlated, but far apart. And finally, we looked at go terms. So go terms are gene sets that uh, represent uh, biological functions or uh, components. And so uh, each of these go terms has a certain gene set size. So we were looking at um, specific gene sets so uh, that have a small number of genes in them or more broad ones, so with more. And we actually found a, a relationship between the specificity of the go term in terms of size and the maximal Euclidean distance. So the, the, the go terms that were sort of more precise contained less genes and these genes were close by versus um, the more broad ones that were sort of further apart. 
So we concluded that the learned gene representation reflects some matter of go term membership. Finally, uh, we wanted to evaluate how the learned representation was good at um, another auxiliary task. So like capturing things that the model doesn't really have access to. So to do so, um, we extracted uh, certain amounts of labels from this publication here. So the Immune Landscape of Cancer by Thorson and colleagues in 2018, which was done on the TCGA gene expression data set. And here, there are two uh, types of tasks. There's classification tasks, so there are actual labels, like classes. And then there's regression tasks, so these are measurements, real values. Um, for each of these, we have trained one of each of these models. So the yellow one is factorized embeddings, two T-SNEs, so a 2D and a 50D one, a PCA and a 50D UMAP. And for every one of these tasks, we did 25 reshuffles of the data and uh, we measured the performance. So to measure performance for the classification task, we use the classification accuracy. For the regression task, we use the Pearson correlation. So here you're looking at this task here, BCR richness and TCR richness. And you can see that the factorized embeddings is outperforming all of these models, uh, a bit less the TSNE 50D one than the other ones, but uh, still statistically significant. How we do this, we use an ANOVA test followed by post hoc Tukey tests to determine uh, if the difference is statistically significant. So if we're looking at rank only, um, here we grouped all the tasks according to sort of broad categories. And you can see that the factorized embeddings about 60 to 70% of the time is in first rank. And most of the time, either in first or in second. And then uh, TSNE is mostly in second and sometimes in first. And then the other three models seem to be performing uh, sort of um, similarly. If we're looking at statistically significant differences, um, oops. If we're looking at statistically significant differences, um, here the color is the amount of times the factorized embeddings is better, statistically significantly better than this other model. So for example, out of um, four microscopy tasks, uh, factorized embeddings is better than UMAP uh, four times out of four, and this is statistically significant. So this zero here means that the genomic instability tasks, the factorized embeddings is performing at least at most on par with TSNE 50D or less better. So um, overall, our conclusion is that the factorized embeddings is outperforming most models on most of these very, very tasks. So this means that the uh, representation the factorized embeddings has learned allows it to, well, actually allows it to be used in like auxiliary tasks and recover all of this information. So this was very encouraging. So um, from here, uh, the conclusions are that the factorized embeddings data with, uh, reconstructs data with high accuracy and preserves sample pairwise distances. We also found that the sample embeddings are consistent with individual gene expression levels. Uh, the embedding space is dense and it allows for interpolation. And also in 50D, we have found that the factorized embeddings retain individual specific information. The learned gene representation reflects gene, speci gene tissue specificity and some gene-gene correlations. And finally, we also found a bit of GoTerm membership that was there. And finally, um, none of this work would have been possible without these wonderful, wonderful people. So I would like to thank all of the members of the Perrault Lab, Mila Medical Team, the Lemur Lab, the Bioinformatics Platform, 